Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is John Perry, who is the H.W. Stewart Professor of Philosophy at Stanford University. He is the 2009 Howison, Howison Lecturer in Philosophy at UC Berkeley. Hi, Harry. How are you? Glad to be here. Uh, where were you born and raised? I was born in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, and uh, was raised in Nebraska, stayed in Nebraska through college, left in 1964. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Uh, well, I think they had a profound effect, of course. I mean, uh, 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 they were very much, uh, well, my, my father and his family were very Republican. My grandfather had run for Congress in 1936 and was soundly defeated in the Roosevelt landslide. Uh, and I learned that Roosevelt was evil and so forth. My mother's family, on the other hand, were Democrats and my grandfather had a picture of Roosevelt in his bedroom. That's, so uh, uh, the biggest shape was probably my uh, maternal grandfather, who was a, a sign painter, but a very uh, thoughtful man, did a lot of reading. And uh, I don't know, it's just, uh, you grow up in Nebraska, you think that's a normal place to grow up. You look back at it uh, uh, 60 years later, and you think, well, that was, you know, it was a rather, Nebraska in the 50s was a rather unusual place, very suburban, very, my grandfather and I used to go up to uh, the Belfry in a, in a local college every Saturday morning and watch for Russian airplanes. This is in Lincoln, Nebraska, <laughs> you know, the Ground Observer Corps. And, and, <laughs> and we, you know, of course, we, we, like, I suppose, you're old enough to remember ducking and covering in case of nuclear attack. So all that seemed normal now. It seems bizarre. It seemed normal then, it seems quite bizarre now. And, and so as a result of a, a, a line of Democrats and a line of Republicans, was there a lot of uh, political arguments at the dinner table? Uh, no, no. My, my grandfather and my mother's side of the family learned that, that they should just keep quiet. <laughs> <laughs> because the Republican was, uh, side of the family was all lawyers and all articulate and all one of my earliest memories, actually, is the 1948 election. My father and my uncle and a whole, the families and a whole bunch of Republicans had gathered around a big console radio in the living room to celebrate the end of democratic rule. And, <laughs> and you know, as a five-year-old, I, I just remember the emotions of that night. They made a, a, a tremendous impact on me. I think it's when you learn your father is not omnipotent, and I certainly learned it. You know, they were just so devastated that Truman won. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, and what about in in school in Nebraska before you went to college? Any teachers who really? I, I'm I'm curious as to when you got the philosophy bug. I guess it was much later. Well, there was, a, there was a couple of really good teachers. There was one guy uh, uh, named Glenn Fosnott. Actually, his son was, my, was one of my best friends, and he was just a homeroom teacher, actually. He must have taught something else, but he had a big influence, and he was, he was I think he may have been the one that told me to go read Will Durant's Story of Philosophy. That's the first philosophy book I ever read. I was a very mediocre student, uh, tried to play football without success, um, but I, I did a lot of reading. It just didn't translate into much academic uh, prowess until I got to college. And, and where did you go to college, and what did you major in? Well, I went to Doan College. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's the Harvard of Saline County, Nebraska. <laughs> I wanted to go away from home, and I wanted to play football, and it was 25 miles away, and uh, with only about 300 students, I thought I should be able to make the football team. Uh, mm. And did that work out? No. <laughs> did they have a football team? Well, they had a very good football team and uh, uh, played my freshman year, or I sat on the bench my freshman year. And at the end of the year, or at the end of the, you know, the, the football season, the coach put his arm around me and said, Perry, you're small, but you're slow. <laughs> <laughs> but I bet you'd make a really good student. <laughs> So that was very inspiring, and I, I got into academics. And and but but uh, I believe I read somewhere that you wanted to be an engineer. Uh, well, yeah. I, I, as I said, I didn't have my eye on the ball as a high school student. Uh, actually, originally I wanted to go to West Point, but my eyes weren't good enough. And, um, probably wouldn't have gotten in anyway. But so finally, I went to Doan, 
And I had a vague feeling I could be an engineer, but they didn't have a school of engineering. I forgot to check that out. <laughs> so that was, that was about the way things were going then. Then I met, then I met my wife, uh, my, now my wife of uh, 46 years, uh, Frenchie, in my freshman year, and she straightened me out. And so you majored in philosophy? <laughs> majored or? in philosophy and um, went to philosophy graduate school at uh, Cornell University. And it's, uh, philosophy's been very, very good to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I think philosophy is this discipline that, that, that whose main function is to provide a little, a little place for, for bizarre occupants of the gene pool, right? Until, <laughs> until, uh, until, you know, maybe centuries later their particular skills mature, right? So mm -hmm. I think if you go back 50 years, all the people that are now great computer programmers would have been philosophers, but then now they're, now they fit into society in a more normal way. And, and so what, what does it take to be a philosopher? What, what are the skills involved? You, you uh, 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 thinking alone uh, or what? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Of course, as somebody said, philosophy has many mansions. And, uh, 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 but the dominant philosophy in, uh, in, in America during my career has been what's called analytic philosophy. It doesn't mean too much, but uh, it means Basically, you're supposed to be able to write and think clearly and uh, uh, not get into a lot of pomposity in the way that philosophers often do. And, you know, I've been happy in that movement. Uh, but there are philosophers, there's different kinds of philosophers who love to read, love to read philosophy, love to talk philosophy, don't like to write philosophy. And I think they're the, maybe the best philosophers of all, but they don't fit very well into our current academic uh, situation where, where you're rewarded for writing. Uh, what we call research, uh, scholarship, and thinking in the case of philosophy. Uh, other people like the, like uh, F. H. Bradley, a uh, great turn of the century philosophy. He just didn't like to interact with much of anybody. Didn't like to give seminars. Didn't like to talk to people. Just like to sit alone and read his books. Uh, Bertrand Russell, just tremendous energy. Loved to talk. Loved to argue. Loved to lecture. Uh, so. So it takes all sorts, but an, an appreciation for thinking, mm -hmm. either slow, careful thinking in the process of writing in your own study or quick on the feet thinking in the, in the seminar room. Uh, all, all, all great philosophers are good at one kind or other of thinking. Mm -hmm. so, so does the, the fact that you have to publish as a philosopher bias the pool? Because you might have really great philosophers who would be great undergraduate teachers. Well, yes, you might have not only great undergraduate teachers, but huge contributors to their department. Uh, in the old days, you used to, to get by with that. There was a fellow named Rogers Albritton who was a, a professor at uh, uh, Harvard for a long time, and he went to UCLA, published very few things, but had this wide reputation as a brilliant interlocutor and uh, a great person for graduate students to talk to and so forth and so on. And I remember when the chairman at um, at uh, UCLA, a, a wonderful guy named Monty Firth made the case that uh, we should hire Rogers Albritton. Of course, the comparison's always with Socrates. Socrates didn't publish anything, but everybody he was around benefited by talking mm -hmm. to him, and that's the way Rogers Albritton would be. And uh, so Albritton got appointed, but the dean sent a memo that said, don't try that Socrates argument on me ever again. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Nowadays, uh, that kind of appointment would be very, very <laughs> hard to make. Um, but those are often the most useful people in the department. Uh, people like me who aren't very good at getting things read uh, and, and like to write uh, may be much less useful to their colleagues because, you know, I depend on my colleagues to find out about the literature and on my graduate students rather than being a resource for them. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't think I'm useless, but... Uh, what, what sort of courses are, are useful preparation for philosophy other than philosophy courses? I, I math or...? Well, I think math is always a good preparation for anything. I think people that uh, uh, should always... I mean, my, my educational view is, is kids should take some kind of math each year as long as they possibly can even if they're not really making much progress just to keep those brain cells working i wish i'd done that i quit taking math about halfway through college when i decided that wasn't going to be 
the area I went into. Uh, but linguistics these days can be very, uh, very useful because so much philosophy connects with language. And then cognitive science in general, um, computer science, the more theoretical parts of computer science, AI, those are very relevant. Of course, if you're doing the history of philosophy, it's good to know some history. Political science, your field is a very uh, closely associated field. Uh, psychology is very important these days. Uh, Philosophy has gotten a lot more interdisciplinary uh, over the years I've been involved. When I was a graduate student at Cornell, there wasn't much connection with any other uh, department. The feeling was, well, you know, philosophers uh, doing our analytic philosophy were just kind of our own thing. And uh, if other departments want to come and have their conceptual mistakes straightened out, that's fine. Uh, now it's much more interdisciplinary. Philosophers. Uh, get ideas from experiments and cognitive psychology and uh, all, all, so, all sorts of things. So for, for the areas of philosophy I've been involved in, all the different so-called cognitive sciences are very relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what about temperament? What sort of a temperament does a, a would-be philosopher, should he have, should he or she, he or she have? Well, you'd think maybe they should have a philosophical temperament, right? You know, kind of uh, uh, take a broad view of things, be able to see all sides, so forth and so on. I can't say honestly that I see much correlation between having a broad philosophical temperament and being a successful academic mm -hmm. philosopher. I mean, some do, uh, maybe a little more than the average run-of-the-mill uh, uh, population. But unfortunately, or fortunately, you get prima donnas, and you get a lot of people who sit around department meetings and don't seem aware that the university has any other mission than promoting philosophy. You get small-minded people, and so forth and so on. So all types. All types, I'm afraid. But but there must be a lot of the loneliness of the long-distance runner, runner uh, uh, in philosophy. That is that you go off and 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 do a lot of thinking and so on. Well, it's, it's, it's compared to a, a lot of other things that happen at the university. A lot of philosophy is more like math, uh, uh, or where, where, where you know you basically the work is done sitting alone trying to unravel some problem, uh, and less done uh, with a laboratory group. Um, you know, I try to have group meetings every so often of the students who are working with me, but frankly, it never works very well. Um, so it's, it is much different than the kind of team-based scientific endeavors that are, that are fairly common in the university. Does that kind of setting require a, a kind of courage, basically, that you know, as, you're, as you're grappling with problems, and especially if you're making kind of a, a, a breakthrough in some area? Well, I think chutzpah might be a better, <laughs> better word. Way. Yeah, I mean, you're sitting there and you're, I mean, like, I'm going to give a talk this afternoon on free will. Now, people have been thinking about free will for a long time, uh, and very, very smart people. I mean, uh, start, you know, go back to Lucretius. He was no dope, and he had his theory of free will. And then we got the people I'm criticizing, really brilliant guys like Carl Zanet and Peter von Inwagen. So for me to walk into a seminar at, at Berkeley, the greatest university in the world, with all these smart people like John Searle, God knows what he believes about free will, and, and, and say, hey, I figured out the answer. Uh, you know, I'm defending Hume, so I, at least I got one really smart guy on my side. Uh, but I'm going to tell you what Kant and von Inwagen and Genet and, and all these guys have wrong. It takes a certain amount of chutzpah or stupidity, but you know, why not? On the other hand, it's a little bit like Jimmy Carter, you know. He sat on his, uh, when he was governor of Georgia, he sat on his front porch and he met all the candidates that came through running in the Georgia primary or the Georgia caucus. And, and he had this great revelation that these guys weren't any smarter than he was. <laughs> and actually, you know, you might say, well, he was wrong, but I think, I think he was a pretty good president. But anyway, so as, as you go along in philosophy, you know, you start off kind of awestruck. I mean, you're in this profession that's the world's second oldest profession, and, you know, all these brilliant guys from Plato. Uh, and uh, then you meet some people that, you know, you say, well, no doubt about it, that guy's a lot brighter than me when I 
you know, you're going to meet a you meet a Bob Adams or a David Lewis, his names might be familiar to some of my colleagues, or a John Searle, and you say, well, you know. On the other hand, you you do a lot of reading and you meet a lot of people with good reputations and so forth that that uh, you have a little bit of the Jimmy Carter feeling. Well, gosh, I mean, my ideas are as good as those. I've come to have the following view of philosophy that, that's a little bit metaphorical. I think there's a muse of philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I think the muse of philosophy uh, is like the, the, uh, uh, the head person in the public defender's office, right? And they're assigning philosophers to ideas and ideas to philosophers. And the philosophers are supposed to defend the ideas. And the brighter the philosopher, the stupider the idea. <laughs> so it's like, like you give your very best defense lawyer the guy who's most obviously guilty and say, defend him, right? And then more mediocre talents like me, you give really plausible ideas that are easy to defend. So that, that's, my, that's my picture, right? I see. <laughs> now, in the case of the, the person who has the, the worst idea. I won't tell you who I'm no, picking up. No, I'm not <laughs> it. No, uh, just the, following up on the metaphor, does he then improve the idea, or is it like banging his head against the wall? No, no, he, he, becomes in, he or she becomes incredibly famous for working out some elaborate scheme where the idea seems within the scheme quite plausible. So, so like uh, Leibniz, for example, would be a good example with these ideas of, of uh, monads and, and really, really isn't any causation mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. Bizarre ideas, but wonderfully defended. <laughs> uh, so give us a general sense of what a philosopher does. We've talked about the skills. I mean, are you, are you bringing order, uh, a set of rules to a, a domain of ideas? Or well, is that a fair question? Is that a fair question? I, I, I suppose to a certain extent. I mean, um, I mean, a lot of people find it baffling. Well, what do you do in philosophy? I mean, like science is research, but what do you do? You just, they kind of have the feeling, well, philosophy is a finished business. There's all the dead philosophers and philosophy must consist of teaching. But actually, no, you get involved in the same I had, a, I had a teacher once named O.K. Bowsman at the University of Nebraska. I went, up, went to a seminar that he put on when I was going to Doan. And he said the first step in philosophy, the, the basic philosophical talent, is the ability to quicken the sense of the queer, which in those days meant notice what's odd about everyday things. Uh, get puzzled about personal identity, right? Or about, you know, what happens when I lift my hand? Uh, that's, that's the, not every, some philosophers don't have that. Some philosophers just pick up problems from the past and they can do a good job too. But to me, that, that's, that's the fundamental thing is you get puzzled. And it turns out that there are these long, there's problems that have been pro puzzling to people from time immemorial. Mm -hmm. And we can think about them now just as they could think about the very same problems in Plato's time or in Descartes' time. Of course, we have, we have a lot more constraints, we have a lot of science, we have the criticisms that have been made of earlier philosophers, and we should take all those things into account, but when it comes right down to it and you think, well, what, what is the relation between the feel of a pain that I'm aware of in my consciousness and the brain state that is caused physiologically by the thing that causes the pain, are they the same thing? It doesn't seem like a brain state, but what else could it be? There's nothing in there but the brain. When you get it, I mean, you, you're probably thinking thoughts not all that different from the ones that Descartes thought. Mm -hmm. uh, you're thinking about the same problem. And uh, I think it's the great thing about, I mean, <laughs> the philosopher Gottlob Frege asked in uh, 1892, he said, well, A is identical with A, A is identical with B. If they're both true, they both say the same thing because there's just one thing. But you can learn something from A is identical with B that you can't learn from A is identical with A. How is that possible? Well, he thought about it, Russell thought about it, Quine thought about it. We've gone through a whole, the end of the 19th century, all of the 20th century, and now we're in the 21st century, and we're still thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Now, isn't that great? I mean, that's very ecological, right? We're, mm -hmm. we're not wasting problems. Now, in that time, um, the theory of relativity, quantum physics, the airplane, the automobile, <laughs> atomic energy, global warming, all this stuff has happened. 
And yet we're still thinking about the same problem. Now some people might think, what a dumb discipline that never gets <laughs> anything solved. But I think, isn't that great? We have these problems that last forever. And, 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 and in finding the complexity in the simple, you're, you're sort of clearing the, the thought, basically, especially your students, basically, and, and uh, uh, helping them think about things in their own existence in a way. Well, I think particularly when you think of undergraduates, that's your job. Uh, students come in and, and they're, 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 their minds are full of structures that they've gotten from their parents, their teachers, their culture, the particular place they live, now the television and so forth and so on. And then they often have very firm convictions that they don't really have any right to. Mm -hmm. And so your, your job as an introductory philosophy teacher is, is to liberate them, to say, well, look, you shouldn't really believe anything shouldn't really any desire anything until you've yourself thought about it. You've in some sense made it your own desire, your own belief, not just something you believe because your father did, or what's just as bad, because your father didn't. Mm -hmm. um, so shake them up and uh, uh, teach them to think. That's what you do with, uh, with undergraduates. And philosophy problems just turn out to be a great way to get that process started because uh, uh, because at least for some students, they, they find them very gripping, uh, and they learn what a good argument is, what a bad argument is, how something they believed all their life can turn out to be not at all obvious, and that's very good. And when, and when you get to the end, and you get to graduate students, that's very different. They've got some big project they're deeply into, and they know more about it than you do, and there's this huge literature, and your job is just to kind of keep asking questions and make them clarify things and tell them that they're getting too much into jargon and so forth and so on. What, what, what does creativity look like in philosophy, uh, especially when you're, you're rehashing a lot of the old problems? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, creativity is looking at an old problem in a new way, even if the new way is something that's uh, borrowed from a couple centuries before and all of a sudden some philosopher makes it seem plausible where it seemed implausible before. Um, say, take, take this problem I'm talking about this afternoon. When I was a graduate student, everybody thought that Hume was right and, and uh, free will and determinism were compatible. That is, everybody feels, well, gosh, if the world is run according to laws, including human actions, are we really free? Very natural reaction to say is, no, we're not. Hume said, ah, yes, you are. Being free is just doing what you want, and it's okay if your wants, in a law-like way, determine what you do, you're free. Very plausible view when in 19, 70, probably, if you took a poll of analytic philosophers, 90% would be compatibles. Uh, I went to a conference a few years ago uh, and discovered that while I hadn't been paying attention, this whole field had been transformed by people like Janet and Peter von Inwag, who'd, who'd re revitalized these arguments for incompatibilism, the arguments that they say, no, the common person's intuition, that there's something screwy, about being free if the world is run in a law-like way, including human actions, can be given a good, firm, solid argument. Well, that was very original. Mm -hmm. Produce a lot of good work, a lot of good distinctions, even though, in my humble opinion, they're wrong. Now, now let's go back to your education, because you, what did you do your dissertation on at Cornell? Identity, uh, was it? Identity, yeah. I, I, uh, I went to Cornell uh, primarily because it was a hotbed of uh, Wittgenstein studies at the time, and I'd become very enthralled with Wittgenstein. But, uh, but uh, after a couple of years, I got less enthralled with mm -hmm. Wittgenstein and more enthralled with uh, Gottlob Frege, a great philosopher of language and logician and mathematician of the late 19th century, and, and modern people with, more modern people with the same interests like uh, Willard Van Orman Quine and Peter Geech. And so my dissertation was rather on a rather narrow topic, identity, and defending what Frege said as opposed to what Geech said. Um, and uh, a couple years later, when I was at UCLA, a, a, a fellow named Arnie Kaufman asked me if I wanted to do an anthology for a series he was putting together on, uh, on my dissertation topic. And I said, sure, that sounds like a good idea. And he said, well, what's the topic? I said, identity. He said, okay. And, uh, you know, a couple of months later, he brought in a contract to do an anthology on personal identity. I think it never occurred to him that anybody could be interested in just identity. <laughs> so he interpreted his personal identity. So 
I was too embarrassed to, uh, <laughs> to say anything, so I did an anthology on personal identity, and that, that's been a big part of my research ever since. Mm -hmm. And that was the subject of your Howison uh, uh, lecture here uh, yes, to, uh, yeah, yesterday. Yeah, the nature of, our, of the self and self-knowledge very related to the problem of personal identity. Uh, what, is it to, what is the difference between thinking, well, uh, I am sitting here and John Perry is sitting here? Mm -hmm. Well, I believe I'm sitting here, and I believe John Perry is sitting here. Uh, you believe John Perry is sitting here, but you believe you're sitting there. So, mm -hmm. so these I thoughts are, are very interesting. What, what's the difference between thinking about yourself in the first person and thinking about yourself in the third person? Uh, what's, what, what's the difference between the meaning of the word I and, and say, your proper name? Uh, and, and so it, here you are with a problem that you've grappled with mm -hmm. throughout your whole career. How, how has your thinking evolved? I mean, uh, are you affected, for example, by breakthroughs in brain research uh, between f by fads in psychology and so on? I know in the, the 60s, identity was, mm -hmm. was quite a craze. Well, not as much as I probably should be. <laughs> Mostly indirectly by talking to people who, who've conducted the research or their students or my students that have talked to their students. But I must admit, mostly it's a very narrow set of topics. If you go back to 1976, uh, say, so, so, so at my first sabbatical I'd come to Stanford, I was trying to book, write a book on personal identity. And I got to this problem of self-knowledge. And I had this confidence that I had this whole, whole bunch of uh, concepts from, from work in the philosophy of language. And then this appreciation of the problem of the self and personal identity from my work there. And I thought, well, I'm kind of uniquely qualified to put those together and develop a theory. And it, it turned out to be very difficult to, to work within what what I thought of as a Fregian, Gottlob Frege inspired framework, I thought was pretty much correct, uh, to explain the difference between just these I thoughts and, the, and thoughts about yourself it, under some other guise or some, mm -hmm. some other mode of presentation as he would do it. So, so it, didn't, it didn't avail me much to go, I mean, I did some reading, and, 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 but, but the problem was there. There was nothing to do but think about it, you know, and, and, you know, somebody could have told me that, oh, they've just discovered that the brain isn't, is, uh, is, is uh, silicone based or, or that the brain really, you know, it's just oatmeal and, you know, it's your right shoulder that wouldn't have made any difference about that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's in that way, it's a little bit more like math or logic than, uh, than a lot of other parts of academia. You, in your lecture and, and in your book, uh, Identity, Personal Identity and Self, you use the example of uh, uh, a story told by Mach, the, the scientist philosopher. Right. Uh, what is it he saw? And let, let's play with that a little here to give our sense, our audience a sense of well, your lecture. So, right. So the Mach example is Mach relates this early in the analysis of sensations. Uh, and uh, I don't know... So, so, so his point isn't exactly the one that in, intrigues me about it, but he, he gets on a bus uh, uh, in, uh, in Europe or a tram, and, and it's one of these things that has a, win, uh, a mirror at the opposite end, so the conductor on a crowded day can, can see people sneaking on and off. And Mach just gets on the bus, looks up, and just sees himself in the mirror, but doesn't realize it's himself. He just thinks he's seeing a guy at the far end of the bus, and he thinks, what a shabby pedagogue that man is. That man is a shabby pedagogue. Now, if you think about it, uh, uh, that man really refers to Mach himself because he's referring to the fellow whose reflection is in the mirror, and he is the fellow whose reflection is in the mirror. So he's saying about himself, or he's noticed about himself, that he's a shabby pedagogue, but we wouldn't really ordinarily call that self-knowledge. But after a while, it, it suddenly hits him. My goodness, that's me. So now he believes, I am a shabby pedagogue. And that's what we would ordinarily call self-knowledge, the kind of thing you express with the first person. Uh, I suppose he used German, but we'll forget that. <laughs> uh, and then you can imagine that, uh, that you know, he might, he might 
if somebody asked him, he'd say, well, I guess that means Mach is a shabby pedagogue. He could refer to himself in the third person. I mean, De Gaulle used to do that. Bob Dole used to do that. I don't know about Mach. <laughs> but if Mach had been in a Bob Doleish or General De Gaulleish mood, he might have said, Mach is a shabby pedagogue. So there's three different ways of saying the same thing. And they really correspond to three different ways of thinking mm -hmm. the same thing. We say it's the same thing because it's the same individual and the same property, being a shabby pedagogue. But the thoughts are quite different. They have different causes and they have different effects. When Mach realizes that he's a shabby pedagogue, that is when he realizes what he would express with, I am a shabby pedagogue, then he might, you know, wipe the lint off himself. Mm -hmm. As long as he doesn't realize that it's he that he's seeing, he might if he's really upset by the lint on the guy's tie, he might shout at him at the other end of the bus, get that lint off your tie, you're disgracing all the pedagogues in, in Vienna. So we have, we have three different thoughts within, a, within a way the same truth conditions that a certain person has a certain property, being a shabby pedagogue. Uh, and yet, they seem to have different causes and effects, and the different causes and effects seem to be related to different meanings mm -hmm. of the thoughts and the sentences we use to express them. Now, you note about this, you have to be in a certain theoretical framework to be bothered by it, right? Mm -hmm. I, mean, you, I, I mean, if you're, if you're an analytical philosopher and you're coming from the works of Frege and Russell, uh, and, you, and you think that there's a strong connection between the meaning of a sentence and its truth conditions, uh, and you believe more or less in truth, then, then you might be bothered by this. Somebody coming from a much different angle uh, uh, might just think it's a trivial thing and not worth worrying about. But to me, it was of fundamental importance. And, and, and what, what would be significant for somebody who's not a philosopher? I mean, does this, does this open up, following, <laughs> let's assume somebody follows what you're saying, does, does it open up your understanding in a way about yourself and, and the world around you, as opposed to just the philosophical, the mm. debates within philosophy? Um, probably not. <laughs> 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 to be honest, uh, because in a way, what the philosopher is, ha what the philosopher, meaning me here, is having trouble with is understanding distinctions that ordinarily, ordinary people make every day with no problem, right? It's mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, uh, my friend Michael Bratman worries about a lot about philosophy of action, what's involved in scratching your head intentionally. Mm -hmm. uh, now, when he gets this all figured out, it's not going to help people scratch their heads. Mm -hmm. the, the, the main effect uh, is, is, is negative. That is, people, uh, bad arguments convince people of crazy things that somehow have profound effects. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're convinced um, by, you know, in the immortality of the soul or the immateriality of the mind, um, it, it may be that, that these, these views are connected with, with misunderstanding the logic of self-knowledge at some point, or misunderstanding uh, uh, basic things in the philosophy of action. So, so I think philosophers do, do have a occasionally good effect, sometimes a bad effect, but occasionally a good effect by, by undermining very complicated views with uh, with sometimes broad social and political implications that ultimately are based on confusions about very complicated things under the surface, but very simple things on the surface, like the way we talk and think about ourselves mm -hmm. or what's involved in scratching your head. In, in explicating these ideas yesterday, you used the, the concept of a buffer and a file, which, which as a layman <laughs> struck me as, you know, clarifying things Explain that to our audience, because I, I think it's useful, and then it it helps one understand this this recognition that you were talking about earlier, which when Mach realizes that the shabby person mm -hmm. that he has seen is himself. So this is basically a view I've come to that that, to, in my view, demystifies self knowledge to a certain extent. And so so let me give you this analogy. Instead of a buffer, let's talk about an an inbox or a or a uh, uh, you know, a notepad. So you're a professor and you have a certain number of undergraduate advisees you have to deal with. And at the beginning of the term, they come in and introduce themselves. 
So you have this pad of paper and you, you write down things about, about, your, about the person you're talking to, right? Their name, what they look like. What are you trying to do there? Well, you're trying to do two things. You're trying to get information that allow you to recognize them again. Then you're trying to get information that will allow you, once you recognize them, to say something intelligent to them and to help them with their problems. Mm -hmm. So two really different kinds of information. And, and while you're in face-to-face -face contact, I call that accumulation of information uh, a, a, a buffer, right? Then they leave. So, so now your information is no longer attached to a perception. So if it's going to be of any use to you, it has to have enough stuff there that you'll be able to recognize them again. Then what do you do with that? Well, uh, if you're me, you toss it on your desk, you lose it, and you have to start all over next time. But uh, ideally, you go pull open your filing cabinet, or, or in, I guess in these days, who's on your computer, but let's say pull open your filing cabinet, take out a, a manila folder, put the kid's name on the top of it, put your notes in there. Then pretty soon from the registrar's office comes his uh, grade sheets or so forth. And you, if you're good, you stick those in the same file. And maybe you get an email or two and you print them out. Put them, so, so you get a file that accumulates stuff. The file is what I call detached. It's, it, it's not tied to any particular perception or way of finding out about the person. So we have this detached and attached knowledge. Attached knowledge, you're actually perceiving the person or talking to them on the phone. You've got some way of knowing about them. Usually also provide some way of interacting with them, talking to them, uh, uh, startling them, giving them a book to read. Uh, and then detached. Uh, the kid goes off. He could be in, in Burma or New York or Canada or he could be in the office next door. You don't know, but you have this file about the kid. Right, and why is it useful? Because he might come in again, and then you can talk to him, recognize him, so forth and so on. So in dealing with objects in the world, most objects in the world, we, we have this bifurcation between two ways of dealing with them. When, 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 when we're actually adding knowledge to the thing because we're in some kind of connection with them, and then uh, when we've just got the files. And this, is, and this you know, translates into the head. The buffer is a mental operation. When I'm, so I've got my hairy buffer now. I'm noticing things about you. Subtle gray tie, very distinguished dress, thoughtful expression, uh, well, well, you know, good haircut, so mm -hmm. forth and so on. Um, and then uh, tomorrow, the next day, I'll, I'll still have this, this file, Harry Kiesler file, that says, and, and I will be able to use it to recognize information about you. And next time I meet you, hopefully, although at my age it's always touch and go, uh, there'll be enough in there that I can recognize you and recall our experiences together in old times and the way we got completely wasted last night and were arrested. <laughs> I, I don't know if you want your fans <laughs> to know about that. But um, now, what's, what's special about self-knowledge, on my theory, is within this ordinary framework, is that you have a buffer for yourself because you do have ways of finding out about yourself that aren't ways about finding out about anyone else. Just like looking straight ahead is a way of finding out about the person in front of you, introspecting is a way of finding out about yourself. If I want to find out about your hands, I look that way. If I want to find out about my hands, I look this way. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to brush lint off your tie, I would do something that I won't do because it would probably embarrass you. If I want to brush lint off my tie, I go like that. So, so we have a buffer for ourselves, and that's what I call a self-notion. That's associated with the word I. But we also have a detached file of ourselves because we do, that's, character, that's the thing about living in this information-rich environment that language and plus all technology gives us. We have all sorts of ways of finding out about ourselves that are really the same ways we find about, about other people. Uh, when I wanted to find out what time uh, we were going to meet in the hotel, I looked down this this uh, sheet of paper, and it said John Perry and Harry Kiesler meet at a certain time. So I find out by reading my name, the same way anybody else might find out when we meet. So we've got these two, we've got files on ourselves, and the files consist of not just stuff that we get in the ordinary way we find out about ourselves, the special ways we have finding out about ourselves, but also all the stuff we find out about ourselves in the same way that we find out about other people. Now, what's special, is that in the case of self-knowledge, you never need to divide them. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a different kid sitting in front of me each hour of the day till I work through all my mm -hmm. advisees. So I have to distinguish between the information I'm getting through my buffer and the file. You know, 
I have to detach. With yourself, uh, your, your buffer is your file. Now, maybe your parents played a trick on you and, and convinced you you were the reincarnation of Woodrow Wilson, and then when you got to be 20, you had to kind of make a, but mostly, <laughs> mostly we get it right. Mostly we know who we are. And uh, so, so our, our self-knowledge is very special and unique, but it's not special and unique because of some mysteriously cosmically perplexing immaterial, immortal self, it's different because of ways that once you have a proper theory of knowledge, you can see are just, uh, just a special case uh, that comes with identity. So that's, that's how it's supposed to work. So, so back to Mach on the bus. Right. So what, that, that moment of recognition, is he seeing the, uh, the buffer and the file simultaneously and saying, ah, well, so, so, so his case is kind of special. So he sees a guy at the end and he says, I, as I would say, opens up a buffer. As far as he knows, he's never seen that guy before. And he says, huh, there's a guy. And he, he watches him for a while, I mean, maybe just a few seconds, but he's accumulating information about the person he sees, about the person he's got information about through vision. Um, and so for a while there, he's got his self notion. He's picking up knowledge about himself. If his stomach rumbles, he knows that in the way one knows one's own stomach is rumbling. I mean, uh, uh, if his glasses are dirty, he knows that in the way we know our own glasses are dirty. Uh, and at the same time, he's got another buffer for that guy. And then all of a sudden he realizes, hmm. right, that these are buffers of, of the same person. They need to be merged. Mm -hmm. uh, and another example of the same thing not involving the self, you're, you're, you're talking to someone on the phone and you're looking out your window and, and, and seeing a woman in a phone booth. Uh, and it turns out the person you're seeing and the person you're talking to are the same. But you might go quite a while without realizing mm -hmm. that. You've got two buffers, person I'm talking to, person I'm seeing, mm -hmm. and you realize they're the same. Same with mock, except one of them is, is the self buffer, the one where he keeps, where he stores information that he picks up in those ways that we just know about ourselves. But but is he is he realize is, is this a new piece of information to go into his file that he's the rumpled person that he sees in the mirror? Yes, it is. A, it is a new piece of information, and that's an interesting point because that that gets it at uh, uh, one one of the pro one of the aspects of the problem is that kind of information. A is the same as B, uh, where it, it, it is something that traditional philosophical theories of information have a problem with. This goes back to the problem I mentioned earlier that Frege had about identity sentences. Uh, if we think of information as, well, what does the world have to be like for this sentence to be true? Or what does the world have to be like for this thought to be true? Then a natural way to do it is, well, you say, well, what objects are involved? And what do they have to be like? So if I think Harry has a gray tie, what, is the, what does that thought have to, what does the world have to be like for that thought to be tried? Well, this individual right here has to have a gray tie. So that's, that's what you learn. That's the information. But, but what, what, how about the difference between Harry has a gray tie and that man has a gray tie? Well, at that level of information, you can't get at the difference because mm -hmm. you are that man and you are Harry. Mm -hmm. So you have to back up and adopt a slightly different way of looking at the information that I call the reflexive theory, which readers can get my wonderful book, Reference and Reflexivity, makes a great uh, Christmas gift, you know, <laughs> small, compact, uh, and read all about. Uh, and, and this, uh, in other words, our, our ordinary ways of thinking, it suffices to just keep track of when people are saying the same thing and what people think and what they learn, just in terms of the objects they're learning about and what they learn about them. But in a lot of cases that fascinate philosophers and that you need to get straight to make the whole theory work smooth, that doesn't quite work and you have to back off a little bit. That was, that was where Frege's problem came from. And, and the problem of self-knowledge is, again, an example of that. Some of the puzzles about self-knowledge are really just special cases of this puzzle about, about uh, how, how do you represent when you learn when A is B. If A is B, there's just one thing you're learning about, but it seems like there's two things involved. Mm -hmm. And you have to kind of give up the ordinary, as I call it, the subject matter level of analyzing knowledge in order to understand what's going on. Uh, for a number of years, you've actually had a radio program 
uh, a model after car talk called philosophy talk. Yeah, now we don't we don't like to say it's model after car talk oh, because that was a joke I heard <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean it actually was, but we don't like to say it because program directors say, "Oh, another imitator of car talk." <laughs> See. So, so now our official story is no, it's it's, it's modeled after money talk with I Bob see. Brinker. Right? I see. Well, that's a better uh, comparison yeah. in these times. So, what what are you trying to do there? Are you you trying to uh, with your your partner uh, Ken Taylor, uh, Ken Taylor from the philosophy department at Stanford, trying to uh, show the utility of philosophy for everyday life, bring philosophy to the masses. What's your goal and how are you doing it? Well, I would say the goal is twofold. In, in the first place, we, we, we think, I've thought, Ken thinks for a long time, that uh, uh, a lot of people are naturally, have natural philosophical interests and they would enjoy philosophy if they knew about it. Uh, uh, but, but in American culture, it's, it's it's somewhat under, it, it's low profile. In other words, you have a lot of people that go through college and learn that they like literature and spend their lives uh, reading book mm -hmm. reviews, reading books and enjoying, not being, they're not necessarily academic professors of literature, but they enjoy literature. Same should be with philosophy. Philosophy is a wonderful enterprise that's been going on forever. Uh, and at least a certain percentage of the population is gonna be intrigued by it. And they ought to have this appetite uh, sustained by public radio in the same way that people that like music and literature do. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that we think that the standards of discussion in philosophy, where you don't deal with sound bites, but we have a whole hour to discuss a, a problem. We, first we, we work out a couple of concepts between ourselves, then we have an expert come in, then we have callers. Uh, we don't try to be aggressive, we don't try to score points, we don't you know, we just try to understand what's going on. Uh, we think it's a good model of uh, civilized communication that's somewhat lacking in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 the, in the sphere of communications these days. Uh, even something as good as PBS, uh, still, uh, uh, you know, you're very, usually when, when um, people get to an issue of principle, or a philosophical issue or, or something that comes down to some basic disagreement between political philosophies. They say, well, you know, that, that just kind of depends on your basic political philosophy and move on. As if once mm -hmm. you get that far, you really can't discuss it intelligently, mm -hmm. right? Abortion. Well, you know, this gets down to what you think the human soul is. Yes. Well, now reporting from Moscow. I mean, but you can discuss that. That's yeah. open to discussion. Where did these ideas about the human soul, the embryo, where do they come from? What are the rights and wrongs? What, maybe we won't find the answer, maybe we won't convince anyone, but they can be rationally discussed just like anything else. And, and what, what do you think is the resistance uh, to that uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, this not being done more broadly, for example? That is, okay, let, how, how should we think about thinking about the issues that are really important to us? Well, I, I don't have a full diagnosis. I know that we've had a lot of trouble getting on stations because program directors just can't believe people are interested in this. Mm. On the other hand, in the places where we are on the radio, we, we get a huge amount of interest. I mean, Ken and I were, were on Oregon Public Radio, uh, so the Oregon is probably the state in which is most saturated with philosophy talk because they've got about 16 different substations and so on. We were in a cab in Portland once talking to each other in the back of the cab and the cabbie turned around and said, hey, you're the car, I mean, you're the philosophy <laughs> talk guy. Get that out of there. Yeah. You're the philosophy talk guys. So I, there is there is a public for it. We get people get our uh, podcasts and download our program and listen to our program. We always have plenty of callers. But there's a certain blindness uh, on, the, on the part of the program directors uh, and, and if you look at institutions like the NEH and so forth, philosophy just tends to be, in America, underrepresented. Mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, I have various theories. Of, uh, a lot of it, up higher education in America originally was based on a normal school concept of basically you're teaching, you're, you're, you're teaching teachers, you're training teachers, and the humanities were basically English and history. Those were, uh, philosophy was came lately in in Europe, where universities grew more out of these ancient monast 
monasteries and, and things like that, philosophy's always been a bigger presence. You, you uh, in your lecture and in some of your writings, uh, evince a, a great wit. Thank uh, you. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious what you think the roots of that are. Is it that as a philosopher, you, you sort of uh, think uh, in terms of meta concepts and that a humorist is sort of once removed from that? Or is it just something that comes out of your background? Well, probably both. I mean, uh, my family always uh, liked humor and um, also, uh, I don't know, there's these various psychoanalytic interpretations of people that have to be funny, you know, mm -hmm. comedians usually terribly unhappy and looking for acceptance. I suppose that's all part of the mix, but I do think you're on to something. I think there is a, a kind of a, a connection between philosophical thinking, looking for unexpected connections, and, and, mm. and uh, uh, we'll take George Carlin, be a great example of somebody who steps back and, and looks at an ordinary word or an ordinary usage and say, that's really amazing, we do things like that. And a lot of philosophy consists of the, of the same thing. I have probably the, mo the thing I wrote that uh, has been most read it's not my incredibly profound analyses of the human condition and the nature of the self, but my article on procrastination. And I suppose what's unusual about that is it's more or less a defense of procrastination. Mm -hmm. And maybe it would take a philosopher to, to think of defending procrastination. And, and you do it quite well Thank on, you. on a website created, I believe I read, by your granddaughter. Right, right. Structuredprocrastination.com. And, 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 and you're a progressive, uh, drawing on the democratic line in, in your family history. You're a progressive on procrastination. Yes. Why yeah. is that? <laughs> well, I don't really recommend procrastination <laughs> to those who don't have a problem with procrastination. Mm -hmm. What I really recommend is if you procrastinate, and feel bad about yourself, uh, maybe you're making a mistake. Take a careful look at it and see if you aren't really a structured procrastinator. That is, if you aren't one of these people, like I think I am, that get an enormous amount done. Uh, While and, you're procrastinating. Yes, yes, but as a way of not doing something else, mm -hmm. right? Now, that's not the perfect way to be. That's not the way Aristotle would want the perfectly rational animal to behave. But for most of us, it's a, it's a pretty good compromise. And then if you have, as I do, good self-deceptive skills, <laughs> <laughs> then, you can, then you can convince yourself that you've got this really important project that really isn't important. And then, then you're home free, right? Because as a way of not doing something that really isn't that important, you can do all sorts of things that you, you, you uh, will get a lot of credit for doing. In, so. in, in fact, the great enemy here, you say in your newest second essay on procrastination is perfectionism. So it, it's really trying to live up to a picture that you see of yourself in the mirror when you got on the bus. Yes, <laughs> is that exactly. Or, or you didn't see. It's like, ah, what a shabby guy that is. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so, of course, procrastination, psychologists will tell you, have, has various types and roots. Some are very serious and you should just go, go see a shrink or or something like that. <laughs> but I think an enormous number of, our, of us procrastinators are closet perfectionists. By that I mean we don't ever really do anything perfectly. I've never done anything perfectly in my life, never come close. So it seems odd to call me a perfectionist. But I always plan on doing things mm. perfectly, right? So, so, so I get an email from the dean, would you write a report on this, you know, uh, uh, case uh, or or you know some student discipline case or something or or I get a, a a publisher asked me to write a referee report on a book and my immediate reaction is boy I'm going to write the best report that's ever been done I'm going to you know and and then of course I set the bar so high that I procrastinate and don't do it so the perfectionism even though it never results in doing anything perfect results in procrastination, which is a way of getting to a point where you can give yourself permission to do a less than perfect job. Now, the, the course, for most tasks, a less than perfect job is fine, right? Mm -hmm. If you're writing a, a publisher's report, referee report on a book, there's no reason it should read like Churchill. There's no reason it should have the scholarship uh, uh, of something that's going to be in the Encyclopedia Britannica. It should be an intelligent report. And so if you're a perfectionist, you, 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 you kind of start out thinking you're going to do the perfect thing, 
And then by procrastinating and suddenly realize you've only got two days to do it, or it's two days overdue is more likely, that, that's a way of giving yourself permission to do what's probably a completely adequate piece of work. So that's something I think the perfectionists can get over with a little self-discipline, but a little self-discipline may be too much. Uh, one final question requiring a, a brief answer. Uh, uh, students out there watching this program, whatever they plan for their future, how, how do you think philosophy, they should integrate philosophy in, into those plans? Well, besides I think, watching your program yeah, besides, or listening to your program. Besides watching your program or listening to the program. Well, if they're college students, they should take an intro philosophy course because who knows, it's, it might be something that, uh, that you really enjoy. And uh, by the time you get to college, you take an introductory piano course, it's probably too late to, to really get too much into the piano, although you might enjoy it. But philosophy, nice thing about philosophy is that you, you can get into these problems fairly quickly. You don't need to, to take preparatory courses for years and years. Uh, if you're going into a professional school like uh, a law or, or business or even medicine, uh, philosophy is a very good minor or even a major uh, because it helps you do well on those tests that you take to get in and, and uh, the skills of the lawyer and the skills of the philosopher are very similar, making the true appear the false and the false appear mm -hmm. the true. Uh, if, you're, um, if, if you really get stung by the philosophy bug uh, and, and, you, uh, and you want to get a PhD in philosophy uh, and, and thereby uh, you know, uh, uh, lessen your lifetime earning prospects considerably. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, there aren't that many jobs, but I must say, if you manage to get one of them, it's a wonderful profession. It, it, it couldn't be better. Uh, if, you're, if you're out there and you're not a college student or you were a college student, there's just a lot of good philosophy books to read. Um, when I was a kid, I read Will Durant's Story of Philosophy. I think it's still a great book. It's a little dated. It's a long book, a little pretentious, but, but very good. But, but the thing is, you can just plunge right into the classics. Read Plato's Republic or uh, Descartes' Meditations. Mm -hmm. um, go to your local bookstore, and in the philosophy section, there'll be some good used paperbacks by names you remember. And you'll find that even if you read them in college and hated them, with the wisdom that comes from being a little older, you may find them quite fascinating. And, and in the Bay Area, where is your radio program uh, heard? We, we come from KALW, the little station that could in San Francisco. San Francisco's oldest FM station, uh, but not its biggest by a long shot. And, and when are you on? Uh, we're on live 10 o'clock Sunday morning. We're on uh, repeat at uh, noon Tuesday. Uh, and you can stream our program from, uh, either, from the philosophytalk.org website. And if you want to spend a little money and get a podcast you can listen to while you jog or whatever, uh, you can do that too. So there's no excuse for not listening to Philosophy Talk. Well, uh, on that uh, note of public education, <laughs> Professor Perry, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me, Harry. I enjoyed talking to you thoroughly. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.